So hi, my name is Day Al Mohammed. I'm a, a visually impaired uh, woman of color, uh, clearly with a disability, and uh, also an immigrant. So that's uh, one of those things where you get to say I, I have a lot of different uh, identities that I carry with me. Uh, when it comes to what I do, uh, I actually have a pretty eclectic, eclectic resume. Uh, I actually have been a lobbyist for many, many years. I worked with the American Council of the Blind. I worked with the American Psychological Association. Uh, I worked on legislation such as the, um, the Hate Crime Prevention Act and on the ACA, specifically focusing on uh, minority health, including disability health. I've worked on education, language preservation for Native populations, and addressing uh, youth with disabilities within the education system. I've worked in telecommunications and um, and addressing things like captioning and audio description. And for the last few years, I've actually worked with the U.S. Department of Labor on issues related to employment and disability. And actually, most recently now, I work with OSHA on occupational safety and health in the workplace. So I've got a pretty broad swath of what I have done historically, um, I guess, during my day job and outside of that actually i i write fiction in particular i write science fiction and fantasy and um i've actually been working on a couple of award-winning films in the last few years in particular an interest of mine is the idea of a disability as a cultural component and how that is missing from mainstream society So this year is the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I think for many young people, it has always been there. And for a lot of folks in society, we think about the fact that, well, of course there should be accessibility for people with disabilities. Of course we shouldn't discriminate against people with disabilities. But that's what the law says. And the law itself um, is only like 30 years old. So that's not very long in terms of, of, of laws. If you think about it, you know, we, we have stuff going you know, going back, you know, decades, going back centuries even, that are still on our books and are still impact the way we do things. So for me, as a person with a disability, one of the things is that first moment where you realize that something is not right and something is different. And I think it differs for different groups. So I acquired my disability um, when I was uh, in college. So for me, disability is something that came later in life. It was not part of my identity. It was not part of what I was. It was something that I felt was inflicted upon me. It was something that was a tragedy and my life had ended. And I think one of the things that was important to recognize that I'm still me. And one of the key elements that was a part of that was there are things you do and things you love, and those are things that make you who you are. And for me, that's always been reading, right? And suddenly, uh, I'm now a blind woman. I can't access books. I can't access the information and content that I always had available to me. Um, and it was crushing. And when I discovered um, there actually is were talking books, you know, books on record, audiobooks, and there was the um, um, oh goodness, it was the Reading Services for the Blind, I think is what it was called at the time, and they would send you books every week. They had a catalog, and you could request whatever was there. And suddenly, I had access to everything that had been important to me. So, so for that, that was a big moment for me of recognizing that disability didn't limit me. It let me still be who I was, still do the things I loved. Now, the more I read, the more I realized, wait, what I only have available to me is what, what people took time to record. And as technology has changed and advanced over the years, we now have, we now have the internet. We now have digital books. We have Kindles. We have paper whites, you know. And, and the idea of books in an electronic format and books in audio format, uh, you know, Audible and other companies are making this uh, mainstream, which means everybody has access to it. And for me, that, that first obstacle is how do I get beyond that? And the technology has expanded to make that happen. There's, there's still a long way to go, but that first moment uh, of going, I can't do this, and then finding out that there is an answer to it and that it doesn't change who you are um, was a big moment. Um, and the Americans with Disabilities Act and, and, and access and things like that has been like an underlying component with regard to, we can help you get back to the things that you wanted to do. We can get you back to um, ways around it. It's just learning something a little bit differently, but that doesn't come naturally, right? 
society doesn't make those changes just because they want to, especially starting out. Um, it sometimes takes a law. And because of that law, now everybody in many ways is able to benefit for that. And the same can be said for curb cuts is the argument that's been made for years. Curb cuts, those ramps on sidewalks, were were designed for people in wheelchairs. I'm like, yeah, but bicyclists, you know, mothers with prams, people with heavy luggage, all of those things are a core component of what we, we make in society. And yet people are still fighting to get more of them because we still have so many places we can't go. So the Americans with Disabilities Act really has made a difference. We can see it in the actual literal face of our country. We see it with curb cuts. We see it with captioning on television. We see it simply by the various number of people with disabilities who are out and about in society. Why? Because they now can. There's now a way to do that. When you have an accessible van, you can go places. When there are curb cuts, you can walk around or wheel around your neighborhood. When there's captioning, deaf people can participate in the culture that is America. So, the ADA has absolutely made a difference. One of the places where we're just beginning to see that impact is not necessarily in law, but in culture, right? So uh, one of the things I do is I write science fiction and fantasy. Why I love the genre. The genre talks about um, the future. It talks about what can be, uh, but it's also a very political and always has been a very political genre because it also talks about what is and usually about what is that is not right with the world. And where we haven't seen it so much is in the cultural markers of what represent America, what represent the world. If you turn on your television, you are not going to see people with disabilities existing on screen. If they do, they're helpless victims, they're, you know, sadistic monsters, uh, they're bitter cripples, um, they are, have um, in the case of blind people in particular, amazing psychic abilities or wicked martial arts skills. And those are just, and those are the only roles those folks can get. You, we get the stories of overcoming, I have climbed this mountain, even though I, I, I have this uh, significant disability. And those are the stories we tell. Those are the only stories that people with disabilities are allowed to encompass. I don't want to be someone's after school special. I want to exist, um, you know, as a living, breathing person. I go to work every day. I come home. I have a wonderful wife who I love very much. We watch way too much TV, eat way too much popcorn, um, you know, and God, I wish she wouldn't make me go walking and hiking in the park so much because that's, you know, we're, we're pretty normal people. We don't see that um, within media. We don't see it as much in, in our books and television. And the thing is, uh, culture is shaped very much by media. If you see on television that people with disabilities' lives are tragedies and pitiable, and they're the, the homeless person on the street, they're the, um, the, the, um, the, the person who turned to villainy because of their, their disability, you, you start to have a very skewed view of what disability means. And when someone goes, well, that's, that's just television, that's not real, I'm like, Let's talk about real. Let's talk about the fact if I look at you and go, may the force be with you, everyone knows what you're talking about. If I say, live long and prosper, everyone knows what we're talking about because they are cultural benchmarks in our society. That you, When you say it, we have an idea of what it is and what it means. And we do not have those po a positive marker for disability. We're beginning to see the hints of that. Um, this last year uh, at the professional um, writers organization, Science Fiction Writers of America, we st I started to see some of the winning books and some of the nominated books were written by authors with disabilities. We're seeing authors start to be more open and willing to say, I have a disability, and start to see them include characters which have disabilities. So I think we're just at the tipping point of starting to see more of that, but it's still very much missing in the mainstream. New York City just this last year passed a law saying we want to see more diversity in film so if you bring on uh writers who are minorities uh then guess what we will give you a better tax break as a film production what is not included in that was disability it included gender it included race it disability was not included so if a, if a company tried to be more diverse and hire people with disabilities to work in their film 
it was not seen as being beneficial, it was not included, so there was no real incentive. So um, when we talk about where we wanna be, I would like to see it as, as culture because that is a key component of, of what does it mean to live with a disability? What is real versus what is perception? And, and let me just say, this sounds such a, people go, but isn't there, aren't there more important things like housing and access to education? I'm like, right now, one of the biggest things going on is, 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 is COVID. We're in the middle of a pandemic and there are currently several lawsuits pending about the idea that if someone with a disability comes in, their life is viewed as less valuable, as less meaningful um, and less joyful. So when it comes to determining who gets access to rationed healthcare, just because you have a disability, you are dropped lower on that list. I'm blind, but let me tell you, I'd like to think my life has significant value. I, I definitely have, am filled with joy and, and I, I can't see that having it gauged as being lesser um, is meaningful. My humanity is not less than anyone else's. Yet, the cultural perception and the mainstream perception is that if you have a disability, your life is somehow lesser. And we keep passing laws and the laws are fantastic for giving us access and things like that. But until we actually change people's mindset, which is a cultural shift, um, then, we, then anytime something happens, such as the pandemic, we are constantly battling those old tropes. Remember the life with a disability is a tragedy, that everything is over. And that, that didn't come from law, that, that came from what people learned out in their everyday lives and their perceptions and your TV and your film and your books are a part of that. So what can we do as community members right now? We're, we're at this anniversary year of the Americans with Disabilities Act. We are not just at this moment of time, but going forward. So, so you know, 2021, 2022, 2023, right? Disability doesn't end here. Access doesn't end here. Rights don't end here it continues forward. And it always goes, well, what can I do? I'm just one person. And the fact is, all movements started with one person, right? Every single person has an impact and has ripples. So the biggest thing currently happening beyond uh, the pandemic this year is we're seeing um, uh, uh, a movement with regard to race. We're seeing people protesting uh, the deaths of young black men. No, actually, let me correct that, the murders of young black men. So you're gonna hear that from me. Why? Because we keep thinking about things as being, what's well, a one-off, this bad thing happened. But until we acknowledge that there is a structural problem in the way we have, 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 have built this country, then, then the problems will continue to exist because we keep thinking of them as, as one-offs and the fact is it's not true. Now, why am I talking about this when, uh, uh, when we're talking about the Americans with Disabilities Act? Because one of the key things that, that doesn't always get as much mention is 40% of those, those, those young black men had disabilities. For when it comes to police action, um, particularly for folks with mental health conditions, especially if they are in crisis, the response from law enforcement has been unilaterally pretty much negative and that has led to people's actual deaths and that and so until we recognize that disability doesn't exist in a box but that it intersects with other other things we're talking about how it intersects with race how it intersects with lgbtq status how it intersects with immigration status do you know it it it, it currently says if you have a disability or condition that means you may end up on public benefits of some sort then you can be refused entry to the united states so it so goes, wow, well, we don't want that kind in here. And, and let, let me also say, um, I, I'm an immigrant. I came here from uh, Bahrain, which is an island in the Middle East. And so when I immigrated to the United States, um, I, I, my mom had to actually fill out documentation to prove um, that, uh, that I would not be a burden on American society. And it required paperwork and proof and all of this to say, you're not going to be a burden because you have a disability, you're gonna be a problem. That's, what, that's the reason why she had to fill it out. At the same time she was filling that out that time, I was in law school. 
So the idea that disability is a burden, again, we're back to that cultural perception as being a problem, or the idea of the intersection, the idea of, of an immigrant with a disability is a problem. And, and, and let me be honest, um, I went to law school. I, I have lobbied for marginalized populations my entire life. Uh, I interned at the United Nations. I've interned at the U.S. Senate. Um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a, an, a flotilla officer with the United States Coast Guard Auxiliary. So I would like to believe as a person with a disability, I contribute to this country. Um, and that is, again, the idea of intersection. So when we hear about um, and, and I'm going to use the hyperbolic language because I'm not so sure it's hyperbolic. Children in cages at the border, that's a disability issue. So that is something we need to pay attention to. When we hear about protests in Washington, D.C., in Seattle, in North Carolina, that's a disability issue. We need to recognize that it's a bigger piece of all of this um, and that there are things we can and should be doing about that. So. And some of it may be as simple um, as, as raising your hand and, and, um, and actually a young woman did this in Seattle last night um, because she was at the protests. And so she started Black Disabled Lives Matter. She started chanting that and the crowd followed. So there was a recognition and that by one person, she made that change. Um, there was a, a couple of young African-American women in Washington, D.C. who said, we have disabilities, we want to participate uh, because this impacts us, but we're not so sure we can because we have disabilities. So they gathered a group of, of other young people with disabilities and joined into the other movement. They didn't take away from it, they were a part of it. So, uh, so there are things you can do as an individual, and I'm speaking at disability. So let's say you're an organization look at your board of directors. How many of them have disabilities? How many of them are people of color? How many of them have LGBTQ status? How many people intersect multiples of those? Um, when you put out a, um, your diversity statements, does it include disability? When you ask, if you're a membership organization, right, many of those organizations ask for demographics. Have you included disability as one of your demographics? When you hand out grants, do you know how many of your grantees have people with disabilities or serve disabilities? Do you require that any programs that they provide or do you require that any programs you provide um, have uh, uh, captioning, have a statement that says, hey, if you have any accommodation needs, please contact us. That is one sentence that could be done everywhere, especially now when we have so many online um, events as part of registration, hey, do you have any accommodation needs such as, as captioning or ASL, um, you know, please let us know. That's one sentence tells me as an individual that you are thinking about access. The same goes for spaces and when we eventually get back to holding events in real life, have you set, put any notice in there or any thought into the fact that um, it, when you don't do that, you're leaving out a whole swath of people. And that swath can be as high as 20% of the American population. So if we wanna talk about where we wanna go in the future, it's looking at um, what you can do to make sure disability is a part of everything you do. And then recognizing that disability is a part of everything you do externally as well. Um, and I think the only way to go in the future is to, re to recognize that intersectionality and recognize the interdependence um, of these different movements and activities and that you can't do one without the other or if you do um, uh, there's no justice unless ever there's justice for everyone right